we're back on the zero hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. President Biden went to Massachusetts to a former coal fired plant and announced not a climate emergency, but something close to a climate emergency and uh, some executive actions that were not a climate emergency, but kind of climate emergency like here to shed some more light on that is Dharna Noor, who is a climate reporter for the Boston Globe. She hasn't joined us since she took that job. She used to be with Earther and she covered that event for the Boston Globe. Maybe she can help us decode it a little bit. So Dharna, first of all, welcome back to the Zero Hour. Thanks for having me. Always great to be here. Oh, it's always great to have you. So first of all, what did you make of it? People were calling on uh, President Biden to, uh, we hope he's feeling better from his COVID by the time this broadcast, but wh- wh- what do you make of this? People call, activists were calling on him to declare a climate emergency. He didn't, well, why the waffle? It struck me as kind of like waffling where he said, well, I'm not calling it that, but it really is. Why, why would he do that? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, Biden has called climate change an emergency a number of times, including in his speech yesterday, um, which I don't know, maybe he's teasing that he'll declare a climate emergency. Um, but instead, you know, instead of declaring a climate emergency, which would essentially immediately unlock a whole bunch of executive powers for him. Um, he, you know, sort of uh, made some more modest steps. Um, you know, they're all they're all good. Um, he um, put some more funding into a FEMA program uh, geared towards helping communities build resilience to climate disasters. Um, he added new guidance to the Department of Health and Human Services uh, that allowed communities to, you know, use um, a pot of funding to fund things like uh, efficient air conditioners and things like this. Um, He um, made some new steps on offshore wind. Um, You know, I'm not saying that any of these things are bad, um, but compared to what declaring a climate emergency would have done, and especially compared to like his promises on the campaign trail, and frankly, what is needed to take on this massive and urgent crisis, um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, they were they were modest to say the least. Pretty pretty small bore, as Bill McKibben told me. Yeah, and uh, Bill Mc- Bill McKibben, of course, the uh, famous environmentalist. I kind of tried to. I looked at the White House statement uh, after he gave his talk, and I tried to total up. There weren't a lot of you know. There were some numbers in in the announcement, but a lot of things were announced without numbers. Uh, as far as I could tell, we you know. Two billion here, two billion there. Uh, I couldn't make it come up to more than maybe tops five or six billion for a climate situation that the you know I saw one number that said it was going to cost the United States more than a hundred trillion dollars in the next twenty years or something. It really struck me uh, as a trivial. I mean, I feel like and I mean this in the friendliest way possible, like you're being really nice about it to say, you know, it feels like nothing compared to the magnitude. And, and, you know, he's a nice guy and everything, but it feels like nothing compared to the the magnitude of the crisis we face. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I mean, of course. And all, I mean, I I guess that what I would also say is, um, I mean, as you noted, a number of activists and scholars and lawmakers have been calling on Biden repeatedly to declare a climate emergency, um, essentially using like the Federal Emergencies Act, which is normally reserved for things like, um, you know, terrorist attacks or natural disasters or things like this, um, it, to, to, to use that sort of act and declare climate change to be a, nat- a national emergency. Um, that would allow him to pretty immediately, like uh, without congressional authority, uh, reallocate a bunch of different funding from the um, existing budget to climate uh, measures, um, as well as, you know, kind of integrating more climate concerns into trade and things like this. It would allow him to do all these things. But even that uh, declaration wouldn't mandate him to do any of those things either. Um, and so I think that what we're seeing is, I mean, I, I guess it depends on how you look at it. On the one hand, maybe what we're seeing is um, 
the limited uh, ability of the executive branch to take on this emergency. On the other hand, a number of scholars and uh, research organizations and uh, advocacy groups have kind of laid out all of the massive actions that Biden could take without congressional authority um, that seem to, you know, some of them could really make a huge difference in uh, emissions cuts. You know, I talked to folks who, um, for instance, noted that if he invoked a climate emergency, he could uh, reinstate the crude oil export ban, um, essentially, you know, hugely limiting the amount of uh, fossil fuels that the U.S. is sending abroad. That could have major consequences consequences for global emissions. Um, not not something that we've seen from the Biden administration, frankly, not something that I think that he's indicated that he will do, um, especially since um, being in office. So, yes, I mean, the, the amount of action and the amount of funding, frankly, that it will take to take on this emergency is just uh, totally unprecedented. And what we're seeing um, is not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I had this conversation with another guest this week who from a sort of uh, you know, a left perspective, definitely, but ca- kind of expressed the fear that declaring a climate emergency it was a kind of contrarian perspective. The declaring a climate emergency would give Biden too much power to do things that the public might not like. And while my initial response, well, it was complicated. And we could go into it a little bit. But the one thing that Biden might do that I definitely would not like is allocate a lot of money for blue hydrogen. And the administration has talked about this a little bit. And I am a little bit concerned about seeing federal, a lot of federal funding go into solutions like liquid natural gas, like more drilling, more fracking, more more technology intensive solutions like blue hydrogen. And I guess one thing, uh, while this was a a small bore reaction to a large problem, I didn't see anything in the president's uh, and the White House announcements yesterday that suggested they were going to throw a lot of these uh, oil industry or industry intensive solutions at the problem either. Was there anything in there like that? I hope that my connection is stable as I'm talking here. And I so apologize for um, for uh, my unstable, unstable connection. Um, if the, so the question is, um, if we saw anything that looks like a sort of industry giveaway or an industry-friendly right. friendly solution yesterday, I mean, I think it's tough to say. Um, honestly, these, these uh, mostly the, you know, the uh, solutions that were laid out yesterday focus on resilience um, and boosting the offshore wind industry, which of course, you know, could be um, a giveaway for an industry that's not the fossil fuel industry. Um, but I guess in one sense, you know, the the focus on simply um, essentially the demand side of, um, of the clean energy transition, not the supply side itself, um, you know, kind of it doesn't threaten the fossil fuel industry itself. You know, it does uh, building more, um, you know, wind power, um, you know, kind of expanding the offshore wind sector uh, in theory, you know, can help the, the transition. Um, but, you know, a clean energy transition is not only only about kind of bringing new green power online. It's also about shutting down existing fossil fuels. Uh, you know, UN report after UN report has shown that we need to do that really urgency, that we essentially need to leave all the fossil fuels in the ground that are currently in the ground right now if we want to stave off uh, the worst impacts of the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, I think that what we're seeing once again is that Biden is not really putting so much emphasis, um, it, it really any emphasis at all, uh, especially right now, on shutting down existing fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so in that case, you know, while maybe what we saw was not a, a giveaway to the to the fossil fuel industry in that sense, it certainly is not a threat to them. Um, you know, I think this is particularly interesting because we've seen sort of oil and gas companies move into renewable sectors, um, sort of try to rebrand themselves, create these kind of smaller renewable arms. Uh, and, you know, I, obviously they're doing that because they like see that there's a piece of the pie that they can get. Um, but but doing that and sort of rebranding does not um, kind of threaten their existing business models. And, uh, you know, whether or not it's uh, completely new companies, um, you know, nationally owned uh, wind companies, uh, oil companies that are kind of rebranding as wind companies, no matter who is getting into the new renewable sector, that doesn't exactly mean that fossil fuels are coming offline. Um, so so I guess sort, sort of yes. OK, yeah, no, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I guess the last theory I want to get into, and this is a constant sort of theme of mine in terms of the environment, is it seems to me 
uh, and you're more immersed in this topic than I am, but, you know, from my own contemplation of it, that we're not going to solve this problem without uh, deeply restructuring our consumption of energy. And that means not turning our fossil fuel cars into electric cars, but turning our cars into mass transit and not turning our consumption of disposable uh, fossilized products into, uh, you know, but but getting rid of disposable products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, and I don't see anything in the in the administration's rhetoric about that, or I see very little about that. And so I'm afraid that you know, it's kind of like the cliche about shuffling whatever it is, deck chairs on the Titanic or whatever it might be. I don't see anything that says, uh, you know, yes, it would be difficult to make these kinds of adjustments as a society, but I, I also feel it would give us a sense of social purpose. And I, and I feel as if yeah, I, I could quote, and I will quote, for example, in the White House statement, uh, there's something about uh, the president wants to turn the climate crisis into an opportunity. And I think this kind of Pollyanna-ish language undersells the kind of hard work we have ahead of us. I feel as if, and then I'll stop opinionating, I feel as if we're trying to, you know, they're trying to make it sound easier than it is. They're they They're underselling the magnitude of the task. And I worry that that's leading to a letdown. Uh, do you get what I'm driving at and what my concern is? Oh, I mean, 100%. Um, it's interesting, too, because I think that a lot of the rhetoric that we saw from Biden on the campaign trail, um, you know, and sort of especially uh, in his meetings with uh, Sanders and, and others um, who are sort of, um, you know, uh, staking out a new um, vanguard here, uh, was that, you know, what we need to take on the climate crisis is essentially to transform every sector of the economy. Um, and, and when he would talk about opportunities before, he would talk about the opportunity to create jobs, you know, on the order of like uh, hundreds of thousands um, and and would talk a lot about like the new uh, opportunities for ordinary American people to sort of get in on these new industries, um, which already, you know, I think, again, kind of can leave out uh, the the need to um, also, you know, think about what happens when we close down existing industries. Again, it's not just about creating new jobs, but also about kind of finding new roles for people who had worked in older industries. Um, and, you know, not even just sort of uh, oil and gas themselves, but also, you know, tons of industries that rely on them, like steel and, and others. Um, so, so in some sense, I think that, you know, what we saw from him on the campaign trail was a lot more rhetoric on the, on the order of what you're talking about, on the order of, you know, needing to sort of change every facet of society, every facet of the economy. Um, and I mean, it's kind of no wonder right now, I think that the rhetoric is changing. Um, it would be, you know, it, it would be very unlike Biden to, in a moment where, um, he's kind of being attacked by the right, um, ha having people say that climate action is the reason that, uh, gas prices are so high for which there's obviously no evidence. Um, but, you know, it would be very unlike Biden to sort of look at that situation and say, actually, what I'm going to do is talk more about uh, the massive changes that are needed. Um, but, you know, I think objectively speaking, you know, if they if we have the top scientists in the world saying that the changes that we need are like completely unprecedented, require transformations to like every aspect of society, um, then I think that we can pretty solidly believe that that is the case. Well, I think we can. And, uh, you know, I think as the cops used to say in the old movies, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. But uh, but Darna Noor, a climate reporter for the Boston Globe, I know you've got to go. And the beat you're on is a busy one. So so I know you're insanely busy. Thanks for taking the time to uh, to speak with us. Always great having you on the program. Always great to be here. Thank you so, so much for having me. You bet. Thank you for coming. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.